Well, nevertheless, Mr. Chairman, after this hearing, nevertheless, Mr. Chairman, the practice of this committee has been to give members of this committee an opportunity questions of this character. And I, I, I would like the Secretary to tell me how we can reconcile this kind of an intervention with the moral law that we're supposed to respect with treaty law, with international law, or with any law other than the law of the jungle. But, Senator, now, uh, the period you're talking about is the period between uh, 1970 and 1973. So the beginning of the period to which you refer was in uh, was in a period of still ex considerable hostility and acute Cold War. So in 1970, the perception of the administration was not how to reconcile certain actions with detente, because detente was something that we were still trying to establish. May I please finish my answer? And then uh, I'm trying to explain in reference uh, uh, to your question. Secondly, uh, when the leadership and the president work out a fuller discussion of these issues, I think fairness would have to require that they be discussed not just in terms of any one uh, event in Chile, but of a history that may have preceded it, uh, and that antedated by a considerable number of years, 1970. But let me now deal with a specific issue of, that was posed by Allende. According to the Chilean Constitution, uh, a president is elected by, in two ways, either by a majority vote of the population or failing a majority vote by a majority vote of the Congress among the candidates that were running. And by tradition, the Congress has voted for the candidate that had the largest number of votes, however narrow that margin might have been. In 1970, uh, Allende received a 1% margin over his nearest competitor, but nevertheless only 36 or 37% of the votes, which meant that 63% of the population had not voted for Allende. This in itself it was not unusual in Chile, because almost every modern president of Chile has been elected by relatively narrow margins of this kind. What gave the Allende situation its particular character was that having been elected by 36 percent, he then set about to establish what appeared a one-party government and systematically set about to throttle all opposition parties all opposition press, so that the issue that was raised here was not an intervention in the democratic process. The issue that was raised was whether uh, somebody elected with 36 percent and, frankly, pursuing policies that were be considered hostile to the United States should then do this be, uh, should, um, should uh, be enabled uh, to, s to establish a one-party government. And as the President pointed out, the attempt of the United States government was uh, not to destabilize or to subvert him, but to keep in... But to, but to keep... But to keep in being those political parties that had traditionally contested the elections. And our concern was with the election in 1976, and not at all 
with a coup in 1973 about which we knew nothing and with which we had nothing to do, as I testified to in 1973 and as the President reaffirmed. Well, Mr. Secretary, I just have one comment to make about this, and then I'm through. The present government of Chile is a military government imposed in a bloodbath, and there is no opposition, and there is no dissent, and there is no covert plan either to assist the dissent or the opposition. And there isn't any in Brazil, and there wasn't any in the oh, Greek junta. And for that reason, I, I can't square this policy with what I regard as traditional American principles, and I think it's a sad Mr. episode. Chairman, may I say that this well, I'm finished, Mr. Chairman. Because I, I, I think that we are in danger of getting a, into a matter which we cannot deal with adequately at, in this hearing. This is and Senator Case, Senator have have Fulbright. On this subject after we get the report of the staff. We agreed on that yesterday. Many, many phases of this and have I, to be uh, gone into. It's much too involved to take up at this time. And I think we should operate under the usual limitation of time so that everyone will have some opportunity, at least, to say something about the subject of this hearing. Senator Percy recognized Mr. Chairman, 10 minutes. Mr. Chairman will yield on the point of context before it becomes my turn. As a ranking right. member of the this is Senator uh, Simon, Multinational too. Subcommittee, I, I was astounded to read in the, some of the press uh, these... Uh, accusations and charges made by the, the committee and uh, as to what went on in Chile because it certainly does not coincide with this, the uh, testimony that that uh, committee has received. And if the chair does not want to take it up at this time, then I will not take it up at this time. But I do think that uh, the matter is, is uh, serious enough <coughs> To, to, to have discussion at earliest opportunity because the, the people have heard and read in detail the accusations that have been made against a good many people, including the Secretary of State. And uh, if we're going, to, uh, we're going to proceed with investigations and the theory of detente, I think that this ties into it very tight. Well, the committee voted yesterday to ask the staff to to bring together all the materials relevant to the Chilean matter. And I thought that was agreed to. And this hearing has been set for a very long time on another subject. I think it's quite out of order to proceed on, on this subject at this time. Now, I'm sure at the proper time, the secretary and others will be available for any testimony the committee wishes. Well, I went to the U.S. <coughs> yesterday, so I didn't know that. Uh, I, well, we did vote yesterday and instructed the staff to to make a study of this. I, I hope we can proceed in order now with under the 10-minute rule that we've tried to abide by in these hearings so that everyone will have at least one opportunity to question on the subject of this hearing. Senator from Illinois. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Secretary, it's likely that on the floor of the Senate today we'll have legislation dealing with the Export-Import Bank. Uh, the, one of the most controversial issues is the extension of long-term trade credits to the Soviet Union. Could you give, give us the benefit of your opinion as to the importance of this matter as it respects the detente? Well, our approach uh, to the question of trade with the Soviet Union has been to attempt to relate progress in trade towards progress in political normalization. Uh, our view is that as we can draw the Soviet Union into a web of normal relationship. We can also create vested interests on both sides, and especially in the Soviet Union, in the maintenance of such a relationship. Uh, before the detente process started, we consistently opposed both the extension of trade and the extension of credit. After the detente process developed, we believed that an easing of trade restrictions, including credit restrictions, should go hand in hand with the normalization of political relations. This seemed uh, to us all the more important because we are not the only potential source of either credit or trade for the Soviet Union. And many advanced industrialized countries, including uh, the, uh, the countries of Western Europe and Japan, are prepared to uh, to engage in these activities. Uh, 
We therefore oppose restrictions, uh, though we do not oppose congressional review, but we, uh, we oppose legislative restrictions on, uh, 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 on these, on trade and, uh, and on credit. Up to now, we have given credit in measured terms. We will not give credit for activities that we think are primarily related to military capability. Although, of course, in a complicated economy, there are always trade-offs possible, and it isn't easy uh, to make these distinctions. Up to now, <coughs> the total amount of credit that has been extended is on the, in a three-year period is on the order of $300 million, which is insignificant in terms of the total impact on the Soviet economy, but which is significant in terms of the kind of relationship which it would foreshadow. So we would hope that the Congress would not place uh, restrictions on the limit, on the uh, ceilings, on the amount that could be given, especially as Congress, as we understand, has already written into the bill provisions for review of specific credits of uh, more than, I believe, $40 million. And this we do not oppose. We do not oppose that Congress has the right to review the individual items so that we believe that Congress has sufficient opportunity in its review of the individual items not also to require an absolute ceiling. I'm going to try to phrase this question, the next question in a way that will meet the exacting standards of the chair uh, for the purpose of these hearings. Uh, in the past, uh, Pakistan has had a relationship with China, the People's Republic of China, India with the Soviet Union. To the extent that we tilt one way or the other, it may have some effect upon detente. Uh, in your judgment, uh, in the Ford administration, uh, is there a tilt toward Pakistan or India, and what is our posture in the subcontinent? I ask that question because it will certainly be put to you in your forthcoming visit there, October 27th, 8th, and 9th, and possibly it would save you some time out there if it could be answered for the record right now. Uh, well, the word tilt that was used by an unnamed administration, so as in the background, uh, uh, applied to the conditions of, 19, in, of 1971 and particularly to the conditions of Indian military operations in uh, what is now Bangladesh and our fear of Indian military operations against uh, West Pakistan. Uh, our policy in the subcontinent is to establish uh, relations of friendship with all of the countries on the subcontinent. I think it is safe to say that our rel relations with India have improved dramatically in the years since the India-Pakistan war. I have reason to believe that they will improve considerably over the next months, and my visit to India is designed to accelerate this process. Uh, the Indian Foreign Minister is calling on the President today, and I expect to have extensive talks with him here, and then to continue them with him and Prime Minister Gandhi when I visit India at the end uh, of October. This is not in derogation of our traditional friendship with Pakistan. The United States has no national interest in a rivalry between the countries on the Indian subcontinent. On the contrary, the United States would like the Indian subcontinent to be an area of peace and to the extent that we can, through our actions, contribute to this and to the economic development of the area, uh, we, shall, we shall do so. So I think it is safe in assuming that we are not tilting towards any country on the uh, subcontinent uh, in, in this stage of our policy and that, that, our, that we do not look at the subcontinent as being composed of some countries that are clients of China, others that are clients of the Soviet Union, and yet others that should be clients of the United States. We believe that we can have productive relationships with all of them, and uh, we believe also that, especially with respect to India, our relations are in a stage of dramatic improvement. The second part of the question dealing with the subcontinent uh, relates to the very widespread publicity 
that I saw this weekend in Calcutta and New Delhi on the presumed Moynihan cable back to the department dealing with uh, the covert activities of the CIA. Very great prominence was given to the fact that there is concern by the Prime Minister of India that CIA might become involved in some covert activity in India if her government was not pleasing to us. I told the press in my judgment and based on everything I knew that was a ludicrous assumption. Uh, no comparison in situations, but I would like to give you the opportunity if you'd care to, to comment on that. It might save you time. It'll be one of the first questions put to you out on the subcontinent, I'm sure. Well, Senator Ambassador Moynihan, who is a very good friend of mine, is given to flights of eloquence, particularly <laughs> after returning to Delhi from tiring trips uh, and reading fragmentary news reports. His cables and, are a refreshing uh, change in most of those that I read. I, I think the, his dispatches, which are frequent and extensive, are always a joy to read. <laughs> The, uh, in the New York Times or the Los Angeles Times? <laughs> in, uh, most of the time, I get them first, by the way. <laughs> he, he, also, uh, a, he also thinks that his dispatches are worth reading, so he distributes them rather widely to, <laughs> to various members of the diplomatic corps. Nevertheless, uh, in... In this particular instance, he was expressing a view not about covert operations in India, but in covert operations outside of his area of jurisdiction. For the reasons which I gave earlier, I do not want to address publicly specific issues of covert operations, but I can say this. I have told the government of India, and I repeat it here, that if they find any American official or any other American over whom we have any control at all, engaging in political activities in India. They should let us have the name, and he would be removed from India within 24 hours. And I reaffirm this. Where would he be moved to? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't think that... I wouldn't, if, if I were in India, be exactly satisfied with that. I, are, do you mean that they would be summarily discharged for carrying out functions for which they're not authorized? We are not engaging in, domestic, in the domestic political... We, uh, we are not involved in, domest in the domestic politics of India in any manner. I think that's... So it would have to be an unauthorized act. Lastly, on the, on the subcontinent, uh, because we are making considerable progress in the SALT talks and de-escalating the nuclear arms race, we hope in the mutual and balanced force reductions with uh, uh, Europe, uh, East and West, uh, the question comes up as to whether in the Indian Ocean and in Diego Garcia we may be involved in an escalation. There is concern uh, on the subcontinent on that question in your judgment. Uh, taking into account the President's statements on the three facilities in the Indian Ocean that the, uh, are available to the Soviet Union. Uh, do you feel that the uh, request being made now could in any way endanger uh, our detente or could start us in an escalation in an area that uh, presumably has been a zone of, of peace to date and that has not been a contest between the Soviet Union and the United States as to uh, which, which power can have the greatest force out there? Now, we do not believe that, the, that it would endanger detente. And at the scale of the activities that are now foreseen, we do not believe it would lead to an escalation of the arms race. Is my time up? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Secretary. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Please let me know when my time is up. Uh, Secretary, when the original superb SALT-1 agreement you made in 1972 and defended so well in Moscow was later overthrown down here with the then-president's approval, I predicted then and believe now that nothing meaningful will come out of the SALT-2 discussions. 
and that the arms race, which is obviously being urged on by this administration in its budget, as uh, was recently brought up by the chairman a few minutes ago, uh, will continue. I stress the word meaningful. I'm sure there'll be a lot of words about it, but the arms race is not only continuing, but it's accelerating. It's very expensive. Part of national security, I think, is a sound economy and a sound dollar. Driving home last night, I heard one of our more prominent economists predicting a worldwide depression and giving the difference between the present recession that we're in and another depression that's is, uh, would be comparable to what we went through in the 30s, one great exception. We have far less control of the dollar today than we did then because of the euro dollar, Japanese dollars, and the petro dollars. I was going to bring up uh, questions incident to uh, Chile, especially has been so much interest in it, but I did not know yesterday being at the UN at the view that the, the committee decided not to bring that up. But I would um, uh, like to bring up one more matter. Uh, the, the Soviet Union are opposed to our building a base in the Indian Ocean. The Indians have expressed at least some, uh, to me personally, of, objection to our building this carrier base on the British island Diego Garcia. The uh, recommendations of the uh, military, the Pentagon building, were far different than the original recommendations of, of, the, uh, of the CIA as to our, our, our conclusions as to just what it was that the, uh, that the Soviets were, uh, were doing in the uh, in the Indian Ocean. I would, uh, I would hope that, uh, without getting into any details, that uh, we can take some action to restore public uh, congressional confidence in the procedures by which the Central Intelligence Agency receives its policy guidance and by which the Congress oversees its activities. The real problem is not with the agency itself, but with the system in which it operates. The Congress and the past presidents, in my opinion, are, are more to blame than the agency. I remember some three years ago, and now we're talking about detente, and uh, tying that into things like Diego Garcia, when the chairman of this committee asked the former chairman of the Appropriations Committee whose five senior members are the only senators who really have a look at the budget, whether he knew what the CIA was doing with the money, he replied he didn't know and didn't want to know. Um, all I can say is I don't know who the leaders in the Congress were. I know the Chairman of the Appropriations Committee told me he was not going. Yesterday, the Chairman of this committee wasn't there. Uh, I've been on the CIA subcommittee for uh, the Armed Services Committee for around 10 years, and uh, uh, none of us really know what's going on. We do know that the military are very anxious to take over the intelligence. A talk was given by a, an American general that it would be better if the Defense Department uh, took over intelligence, and then he went to work for the CIA. Uh, he's now back working for the DIA, which is the Defense Intelligence Agency, and a new general has taken his place in the CIA. All I can say is, based on my experience, unless prompt steps can be taken to restore the integrity and position of the CIA with the with the um, uh, in, in the government, instead of constantly uh, knocking it down, no doubt justifiably in some cases, but that's not to be discussed this morning. If you turn the, uh, the estimates of what the Soviet Union are doing over to the military, and you can forget any future value in the American dollar, in my opinion, 
because of what they will say the possible enemy is doing. If you have any doubt about that, I would suggest that you read the reports that were given to the Armed Services Committee about what the Soviet Union was doing in what we used to call, a short time ago, the Ocean of Peace, the Indian Ocean, and then read the uh, first reports before the massaging began from the CIA as to what the Soviet Union was or was not doing in the Indian Ocean. And uh, I regret that uh, we're going ahead with that base. It will be discussed uh, at length on the floor of the Senate because we only agreed to pass it in the committee, provided it was approved by both houses. And uh, that was taken up and agreed to, and also by the president stating it was necessary for national security, which I think he has already done. I personally don't agree with that. I think the arms race is accelerating, not, not only, and I, I've been in this field in this town for some 30 years now, I think it's accelerating to the point where it's jeopardizing the, another important aspect of national security, a sound dollar and, uh, and a sound economy. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I believe I've reached about the limit of my time, and I thank and I, the Secretary I for his courtesy and listening. Which is, uh, I, I think the control that is being exercised over the Central Intelligence Agency through the 40 Committee and uh, the President has already been described. With respect to the analytical function of the CIA, I am not aware that there's any policy guidance that has ever been given to it as to the direction in which it should go. Uh, certainly never at my level has there been any attempt made to indicate even indirectly to the CIA what the expected answer would be. So it's in every instance when we ask for an estimate, there is no discussion uh, from my office, either in the Department of State or in the White House, with the Central Intelligence Agency, until the estimate is completed. And then there's no dispute about the estimate, but simply a briefing from them. Now, in the process of coming up with a joint estimate, what, how the various agencies uh, settle their differences, uh, this is probably what concerns you. Uh, but there is no indication of a, of a preferred answer that is ever given to the Central Intelligence Agency of which, with which I'm familiar. Well, I may say one more thing. As chairman of the Military Construction Subcommittee of the Armed Services Committee, we went into this matter in great detail. And based on the report that we got out of the Pentagon, a vast new armament structure was being rapidly developed in the Indian Ocean. And so I thought it would be uh, wise to get a check on that through the Central Intelligence Agency. And their original report came back and reminded me of what President Kennedy said when two people he sent over to Vietnam came back. He said, I think you're talking about two different countries. You read those two reports, you think you were talking about two different oceans. And uh, I, uh, we, could have, we would have been outvoted, but perhaps the... Uh, we would have been outvoted in the Armed Services Committee, but perhaps the impact of what's happening in this country because of inflation got to the point where they did not want to, uh, the committee did not want to, to vote on it. And uh, lesser amounts were suggested, and uh, we objected to that. And then the question came up as to whether the president should decide. And because we think there's a legislative prerogative, we objected to that. And now it's going to be decided on the basis that if the president says it's needed, it comes back to both houses for thorough discussion. And I would earnestly hope, because of my respect for you, that you look into this matter very thoroughly, because I never saw a greater difference of opinion in the beginning between two government agencies about just what or what not was being done uh, by the uh, other superpower. I'll have to look into Thank it. Thank you. Senator Bell? There's a brief pause while the clerk who is making a record of these hearings changes the tape on his machine. Senator Hubert Humphrey is next on the committee and uh, followed by Senator Muskie of Maine and then Senator Claiborne Pell of Rhode Island. The uh, 
There are no more Republican senators here to uh, alternate with the Democrats, so we'll probably go straight Thank down you, the line, Chairman. beginning with Senator Humphrey. I'd like Humphrey. to follow up on the points raised by Senators Symington and Percy in connection with Diego Garcia, because it does play a direct role in detente in view of the Soviet both official and unofficial protest on it. But this is and Senator Flavin Pell. is really the prisoner of the information he gets, the intelligence he gets. And in this regard, in his press conference, he referred as justification to Diego Garcia the fact that there are three, uh, were, quote, three major naval operating bases, unquote, of the Soviet Union in the Indian Ocean. Well, our definition of a major naval, op na um, of a major base is more than 500 people. And from my CIA briefing, which I also benefited from, I could not, I do not recall one base that had that many Soviet personnel in it. And I was wondering if you could enlighten us as to what are the three major naval operating bases to which President Ford referred in his t uh, press conference. In his press conference. Uh, Uh, I think the president was, uh, was thinking of uh, the port in Somalia, in Aden, and in Iraq. I think the statistics will show that none of them have more than 500 Soviets uh, on board at the well, same time. He may time. not have uh, been fully aware of the technical definition by which major is defined as having more than five, uh, 500. He was thinking of, of Soviet naval facilities and in terms of those three ports. I, I wrote the, a letter to the president on this subject yesterday, and I would like to send you a copy of it and ask you, as you, Senator Symington did, to look at the CIA classified briefing. And uh, I think you will find that there's no base there that could properly be called a major base or even a minor base. There's some well, temporary facilities. What? Nor could Diego Garcia be called a major base. No, but when we get to the nose of the camel under the tent, <coughs> and we uh, see that there'll have to be a carrier out there, and the screening force, and we'll, we'll provide the justification in the future, I think to move it up from a 12 carrier navy where we are now to 15, we'll have a base, and we'll have a commitment there. As of now, we have no commitment in the Indian Ocean, which is a pretty good thing, and of strategic interest to us, it's negligible, but just as the Panama Canal is of value to us as the body of water through which our ships go from east to west coast in our Navy, the Indian Ocean serves that same role and the Suez Canal for the uh, Soviet Union. So I would be grateful if you would look that point up. Now secondly, uh, in view of the fact that the Soviet Union has introduced an agenda item at the General Assembly on weather and climate modification, which, as you know, is a subject we've discussed often before. Could you enlarge a little bit on this mention in your testimony? You say that uh, we're going to begin negotiations on the recently agreed effort to overcome the possible dangers of environmental modification techniques for military purposes. Who will be our negotiator? Where will the negotiations take place? What is the time frame, sir? Uh, on the question of environmental modification, which you and I have had an occasion uh, to discuss previously, we are, of course, in an area of great uncertainty because one is trying to deal with something whose extent is very difficult to foretell at this particular moment. And where those things that one is familiar with are the easiest to deal with and maybe the most irrelevant. Uh, we have started an extensive interdepartmental study on first getting a factual grip on what might be in prospect and how one could go about restricting it because there are many aspects uh, for example that while useful for military technology are also useful for civilian technology uh, methods to disperse fog for example uh, it would be very difficult to know in into what category to put it though its military utility would be self-evident uh, we are planning to start these discussions. Uh, I don't remember, either October or November, November but certainly this year. 
Uh, we have not yet selected a negotiator, but we should do so within the next few weeks. I would think the department would have had ch uh, adequate chance to reach a position on it. I introduced my first draft treaty, sent it to the department for comment about four years ago, and the Senate passed a resolution 82 to 10, directing or advising the department to move ahead, advising the Secretary of State and the administration to move ahead in this field, I think about a year ago. It was my resolution, that's why I remember it. So I would think that uh, the no, study are, should be complete no, by now. No, we, we are developing a position. Uh, but uh, it, was, it was a problem that it took us some time to, uh, to understand. Thank you. Now, a final I must say question. You are, Comment and friendly relation. harassment was very useful. Thank you. <laughs> in connection with detente, and here I would say as one member of this committee, and I think most of us share this view, we stand four square with you in trying to move down this path because obviously uh, the objectives of detente and normal relations are <coughs> to the benefit of us all, and yet we see various groups in this country, be it labor, be it conservatives, be it liberals concerned with human rights, be it the, uh, or the Jewish opinion leaders concerned with the harassment of Jews, or the uh, uh, labor leaders themselves who have their views on, on uh, detente. Each group is nibbling away at it, and if we don't watch out, the whole will be nibbled away at it. And that's why I think hearings like this are great help and I support you. Now, in connection with detente, it involves not only relations with the Soviet Union, but relations with the communist world and the communist countries. And I see a real danger here in connection with the Czechoslovak agreement. As I understand it, we presently have agreements with all the Eastern European countries, except Czechoslovakia, with regard to nationalization of property. In the case of Czechoslovakia, we've concluded one ad referendum, and uh, we will settled for, I think it's 40% of the value of property, and we will return to them the Nazi stolen gold, which we've been holding as ransom <coughs> all these years since. And now I understand there's a movement to derail this agreement. What is your view of the effect of the derailment of this agreement? Well, uh, I believe it would be very unfortunate because uh, I agree with you that the process of detente with the Soviet Union should be accompanied with uh, an improvement of relations in Eastern Europe, because it would be it would be wrong for the United States to ameliorate its relationship with the Soviet Union while the countries in Eastern Europe, with which we have more traditional bonds, are kept behind. Uh, now, in the case of Czechoslovakia, we ha we put this last on our list for the reasons of its recent history. But nevertheless, we felt that the time has now come. This is an agreement similar to ones we've made with other countries, and I believe that the actions that are being contemplated in the Finance Committee would have a very unfortunate effect and would be quite counterproductive. Thank you very much. Sir, may I add a statement that I made? Not going to, we're not going to talk about Chile being searched at this point at, at, at the proper point. Well, I'll I'll no. I'll be Senator Muskie. I'm the last. <laughs> I'd be more than happy to yield what limited seniority I have on this committee. Mr. Secretary, there was a very interesting column in this morning's paper. I don't know whether you had an opportunity to read it, but undertaking to portray a uh, a power struggle going on in the uh, executive branch involving uh, two very formidable personalities, yourself and the Secretary of Defense. Uh, I put my question not because of my interest in whatever substance there may be to the idea of a personality struggle, because I'm interested more in the substance of what appears to be involved, what, what is alleged to be involved. And that is a substantial disagreement within the administration as to how hard a line we ought to follow in negotiations with the Soviet Union in this context of detente. 
Uh, is there substance, if you've read the column, is there substance to it? Uh, and uh, if not, uh, do you have any other observations to make on the point? First, I have very great respect for the Secretary of Defense. He's one of the outstanding analysts of strategic matters uh, that I know. Inevitably, in the nature of his responsibilities, whenever he makes a presentation before the Armed Services Committee, for example, he, it is his obligation to emphasize the military aspect. Uh, this is the charter that he has. Uh, inevitably, it is my responsibility when I testify to take the global diplomatic aspect that includes the military aspect but is not confined by it. Uh, Inevitably, also, there are sometimes differences of view on this or that issue. Nevertheless, I believe that my relationships with the Secretary of Defense are extremely constructive. For example, before I have testified here, he has seen my testimony on the strategic section. I think I'm safe in saying that there is no disagreement uh, with his statement. He made a few minor suggestions, as it turned out, uh, all of which I accepted except one where he overstated my own case. Uh, uh, the statement has also been seen by the President. I believe very strongly that we have had enough personality debates and that what we need now is to focus on the substance of the issues. This is not a struggle. There is no struggle going on between individuals. The president makes the decisions. All the cabinet members will support them. Uh, there are occasional dif differences in emphasis. Uh, there is no difference in philosophy. And there is emphatically not a power struggle between the secretary of defense and myself. May I pursue that with another question on, uh, on, on the substantive side of the question rather than the personality side. Uh, yesterday, the SALT II talks resumed in Geneva. And on September 6th, President Ford stated that there will be a unified American position when the talks begin. And yet Newsweek reported this week that within the administration, debate over a negotiating position is so intense the President Ford has been unable to make a final decision. When the National Security Council sat down last week to review instructions for departing SALT negotiators, concrete proposals weren't even discussed. Now, would you comment on this report? Do we have a unified American position? Do our negotiators plan to table a new set of proposals in Geneva? Well, Again, as a matter of policy, it is not easy to discuss National Security Council dis uh, meetings publicly. But I can tell you in general where we stand. When we shifted from essentially a five-year approach to a 10-year approach, it was necessary to look at the whole nature of our proposals all over again because the difficulty with the five-year approach had been that almost any weapon system that you could imagine would either just start being deployed right after such an agreement would be finished or at the very end of the agreement. So you didn't really know whether you were just deferring by half a year or by a year things that were going to happen anyway and create so much insecurity <coughs> in the process that the whole effort wasn't worth it. And this became increasingly apparent as we were going through a five-year effort, that all the weapons we were really most worried about were just going to go into massive deployment on both sides at the end of the agreement. So the 10-year approach gives us a new opportunity uh, to look at all of these programs again. Uh, it is also clear that there were some special conditions in the last six months within our government that, that um, made it more difficult to uh, generate dispassionate uh, discussion. Our approach is the one that the, that the president explained at his press conference. 
We made no attempt to put down a concrete proposal for the last National Security Council meeting, not because there were such disagreements, but because we first wanted within the government to agree on certain principles, on the emphasis that we were going to put in this negotiation. And we thought it would, in fact, be a mistake to table a concrete proposal in Geneva which would only force the Soviets prematurely to react before they knew what we were about. And what we discussed was, in effect, a classified version of what I have put into this statement. The main headings that are in this statement were essentially what has been discussed on a classified basis. Once the president had made a decision in this area, we are now engaged in putting numbers uh, next to these categories. Uh, the intention has always been that these numbers would then be dealt with by the president early in October and that sometime prior to my going to the Soviet Union at the end of October, we would communicate those numbers to the Soviet leaders and then have a discussion of them when I'm in the Soviet Union. The reason we're doing it this way, with, with the complete consensus of all agencies, is that in our experience, the Soviet leadership prefers to deal with these issues at the highest level uh, rather than by letting them seep up uh, through, uh, through the bureaucracy. So it is totally incorrect to say that there is such disagreement that the president couldn't come to a decision or we couldn't formulate a proposal. We have made no attempt to formulate a proposal. Now that we've had this meeting, that the general guidelines have been given, we are working on formulating the numbers. And probably what we will try to do is to come up with a number of, of approaches and see which one of them will, uh, will work best. Mr. Secretary, I'd like to follow up with this question. In several uh, meetings and executive session of the Foreign Relations Committee, you've proven to be a very eloquent uh, and even passionate spokesman uh, for arms control and the necessity for it. Uh, and I would hope that we might get a similar response uh, to this next uh, uh, observation and question. In an August 20th speech to the American Legion's National Convention in Miami, you stated that in a nuclear age, and I quote, an upper limit exists beyond which additional weapons lose their political significance. It was not a line that was applauded. <laughs> when each superpower is capable of destroying its adversary. You added that a continual expansion of strategic forces by both sides will not result in greater security, but will only lead to new balances at higher levels of complexity and will generate an atmosphere of hostility and suspicion that makes a political conflict more likely. Now, what I'd like to ask you is this. Have we reached this limit? What is your view of sufficiency? Won't the development of new generations of ICBMs, submarine-launched ballistic missiles, and manned bombers all at the same time push us beyond the limit of politically significant weapons and generate the atmosphere of hostility you seem to want to avoid? 